Um, I have friends, new friends, correct? And uh, just as appointed privilege, if you don't mind, I just wanted to introduce one of our judges um, from Broward County. This is Judge Robert Lee. He is our administrative judge uh, in the 17th Judicial Circuit. And it's such an honor uh, to have all of you here um, this morning. This uh, library, uh, by the way, is very near and dear to my heart. It's it's just one of the, my favorite spaces, I think, uh, anywhere, probably in the country, in terms of a library. And I just, to be here uh, to do this book festival, uh, is just such an honor. Please welcome. And um, as, as our, uh, uh, the introduction was saying, first of all, my name is Ginger Learner Wren. And I am a Broward County uh, criminal judge. I have a very uh, rather unusual, that's okay, take a seat, hi, welcome, welcome. A rather um, unusual trajectory um, for judges, which I think uh, really, uh, I think, spearheaded uh, a journey uh, for me, which is, uh, even to this day, uh, is probably as urgent, um, as critical, um, and as challenging <coughs> as it was, uh, you know, when we started in terms of social conditions surrounding mental health in America, and we'll talk and behavioral health in America. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But I, I'm hoping, first of all that all of you uh, that are here today listening really come out of this session really not only feeling inspired uh, by what a small group of concerned citizens can do, uh, as Margaret Mead said, um, when uh, working toward leading change, uh, but also understanding how the court system has really become, in its own way, one of our leading public health problem solvers uh, in the country. When we think that other institutions may be failing, when we think that our government isn't doing and our public officials might not be doing the things that we need to be done, for example, for our communities, I just want you to know that there's a whole nother sphere uh, of public health work that's really what I would call leading from behind. Not necessarily where we want to be in the United States, but, but that justice innovation over the past 30 uh, to 40 years has been nothing short of revolutionary. So I want to start uh, by taking us back, uh, a little bit back in time, uh, to the late 1980s with two amazing law professors. And these law professors uh, actually, uh, one was uh, teaching at the University of Miami and one was visiting his mother <laughs> who lived in Miami Beach and that is Professor Bruce Winnick uh, who uh, unfortunately passed in the summer of 2010 and David uh, Wexler, who um, I'll be seeing tomorrow, actually, at an international uh, therapeutic jurisprudence conference in Rome. But these two uh, scholars, distinguished scholars, met at the University of Miami at a point in time, good morning, welcome, um, where mental health law uh, was just beginning. It was a new emerging discipline in the law and what do scholars do? Um, they talk about case law and they analyze and these two uh, professors basically started uh, comparing notes in terms of cases which <coughs> involved people that were being involuntarily civilly committed. Does everybody know what that means? That means that they suffered from a serious mental illness and they were being committed into what at the time we recognized very well were these institutions that, you know, we, 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 we have images of them, we've seen films, uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest and the older uh, film, of course, Snake Pit. And, and these institutions, these asylums were not therapeutic at all, first of all. They, very, they offered very little 
in terms of treatment and services, particularly back, you know, uh, in the 50s and 60s and 70s and so forth. Um, and um, they, they looked at the case law and they thought to themselves, you know, it just doesn't seem like the people that are the subject of these hearings uh, are being treated in a very positive way. That they are really, uh, quite frankly, being somewhat marginalized in court process, that they're being dehumanized in court process, and in turn, they also recognize that there was an impact in terms of how people would receive the court process. In other words, did they feel that they were being treated fairly, that they have been heard, or that they were being treated uh, unfairly? And that that had a big uh, consequence, that that was consequential in terms of how people would comply with court orders. So these two uh, law professors basically just came up with a concept, just a concept that they thought to themselves, you know, they said, I wonder what would happen if a person with serious mental illness who came before a judge or a magistrate was number one, treated with respect and with dignity, correct? And take that word dignity and kind of hold it up there as really a, a shining star uh, of what we're going to be talking about. And then they uh, ask themselves a question, now wait a minute, what happens in a courtroom? And how can we, in, in, in regards to not only respect and dignity but, dignity, but what else could judges do in a courtroom that would actually bend what they perceived as these invisible forces in a courtroom to make people feel that they've not only been heard, um, but that they would feel that the court process was, as they called it, now working in, in, in the, the, the uh, sphere of mental health law, therapeutic. So their concept was, you know, we believe that not only could courts have an anti-therapeutic impact, and we hear about that all the time. You've heard people say, oh, I'm just, a, I'm just a case, correct? I'm just another statistic, I'm a number. I went before the judge, the judge didn't give me one minute to speak. I didn't feel like I was heard, walks out, and has really no confidence in the system, correct? And so they felt that, well, what if people have voice? What if the judge was able to create a welcoming uh, courtroom culture? What if people were allowed to storytell? Tell us about your life. Tell us about your dreams. Tell us about your goals. Tell us about your passions. And what if they felt then that the playing field was level? How would you feel if you were in a courtroom, for example, and a judge, instead of opening court with all rise, correct? And the judge sits there, and you know that um, judges, you know, historically and traditionally uh, treat everybody alike, correct? And that, okay, well, that's, that's another, we'll get there in a second. You will get there, and I promise you. And so just in terms of this concept, because I really want you not to leave here understanding therapeutic jurisprudence, which the professors understood was a very, very challenging title to their concept, but the idea or the question that professors Winnick and Wexler were asking in the early 80s and through their scholarship was this. Can courts heal? Can courts become therapeutic agents of healing? Now, let's go back now to the early 80s when cocaine was as rampant and as you know uh, impactful as the opioid crisis is here in the United States today. Back in the 80s, we had 
had cocaine cowboys, correct? Remember Miami Vice and all those times in Miami Beach? So here we are in Miami-Dade, and it just so happens we, have, we happen to have a courageous and one of my, one of my absolute heroines, um, bold, state attorney by the name of Janet Reno. By the name of Janet Reno. And if anybody remembers former Attorney General Janet Reno, you know a few things about her. Number one, she's a policy mom. She absolutely is enmeshed in driving policy. And what you might not know about Janet Reno is that her father was Danish. And you would say, well, Judge, what does that matter? Correct? As a matter of fact, her, her father's family came um, and lived in um, Unza, which is really where my husband is from, who's in the back of the room, Ben Nelson. And this was during World War II. And I think we know very much in terms of the Dutch and the Danes, and in terms of how human rights uh, is much of their values system, and uh, how so many families hid Jews during the Holocaust. And Janet Reno, um, as the state attorney in the 80s down in Miami-Dade, which was really the epicenter of cocaine prosecutions at the time, was literally watching, watching this conveyor belt of individuals uh, being arrested. Why? Because they had drug addiction, correct? And she thought to herself, we have to do something. We just can't keep watching all of these young men and women have their lives ruined by going into prison, getting no treatment at all, getting released from prison, and then their addictions are still, correct, not, not treated, and then they recidivate, and then they come back, and then of course the sentences are longer. Remember we had the war on drugs, correct? during this time, so we're, we're talking about prison sentences that were going on for decades, potentially, correct? She decided that, what Janet Reno decided is that she was going to borrow this, this scholarship from these two revolutionary law professors out of the University of Miami. And in 1989, and I know you've all heard of because it's so popular in the United States and around the world. Janet Reno and her uh, criminal justice and substance use community developed the very first drug court in the United States. And there's over 3,000 drug courts in the United States, and then if you start adding behavioral health courts, then if you start adding veterans courts, then if you start adding all of these treatment-oriented courts, you can see now that these two law professors actually somehow, if, you know, if, if they got money, <laughs> I always said this, if they got money for their you know, idea of TJ, I mean, they would absolutely be billionaires at this time because they hit on the idea that in fact, courts and judges uh, could actually take the legal framework and now, create a problem-solving type of justice. Problem-solving courts. Problem-solving courts in the United <coughs> States are now probably one of the most popularized justice innovations that we've got in the law. Now, for example, with the cocaine epidemic, we've got what's called safe baby courts. Safe baby courts or early childhood development courts, and these are actually not even criminal courts. They are civil courts that are embedded in the dependency space so that individuals, moms and that maybe uh, have uh, opioid addictions, for example, don't lose their children to foster care. But instead, these courts are interdisciplinary, they are treatment-focused, they are highly individualized. So 
So in other words, everybody's issues are responded to, they're holistic, and they are collaborative. They are collaborative. So for example, uh, Dr. Spiro, for those who might have listened to him, but who's a psychologist in Broward County dealing with children, he might get called into a case, for example, on a regular basis as part of the collaborative working in a, in a safe baby sport or an early childhood development court. So if you have a problem on a community level, because these courts tend to be locally, um, locally driven, basically grassroots. So in other words, you might have policy failures, you might have resource shortfalls, and who has greater resource shortfalls in mental health, you know, than the state of Florida or Broward County, correct? We're literally 49th to 50th funded in the entire United States. We have no Medicaid expansion, no Medicaid expansion. We get an estimated uh, amount per capita for mental health in the state of Florida of $39.55. What? $39.55 estimated. What? I would say, when I go around nationally, I go, okay, so you can go into Starbucks, you can get five or six grand lattes, and that's how much the state of Florida funds mental health services. And you know that we are now the third largest state in the United States, that we have a highly diverse population, we're a melting pot, correct? And we have large pockets of poverty. Large pockets of poverty. And this is what we know about mental health. Because I also want you to kind of walk away with how important mental health is. And when we're talking about the African American community, correct? And I have to tell you, this is the perfect time for this presentation. Why? Because July, is Mental Health Minority Month, correct? And the taboo surrounding mental health in the African American community is historic, correct? Yes. It is real yeah. for good reason and for not good reason, correct? Yeah. Meaning there's a mixture of why it's, it's, it, there's grounds to be, I'm not going there, I'm going to church, correct? Yeah. Thank you. And, and, but the issue is this. But the issue is this. And that is, we know this in mental health. I, I'm a former um, presidential appointee uh, of, of President George, George Bush. That was for the only the second presidential commission uh, in, in the United States on mental health and, and, and also part of the Clinton administration. Um, in terms of modeling this court to pilot other courts around the United States. My point being, though, is that the prevalence of mental health, it's one in five. If you're in the UK, it's one in four. And that means that no one is immune. It crosses over every strata, it crosses over every race, it crosses over everything. And yet the stigma, the prejudice, the discrimination, interestingly enough, I mean, it's kind of like a unifier. I mean, it's universal. It's universal. I mean, thank goodness now, you know, we see celebrities like Lady Gaga, correct? And, 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 um, and Kanye West and, you know, um, just, just so many celebrities and athletes coming up and talking about mental health now. Correct, really, uh, I think, breaking this silence. But for the African community, the African American community, you know, it's critical. Because what happens is that everybody tries to deal with mental illnesses and mental health conditions on their own. And particularly for African American men, you know, um, I also serve on the United Way Board of Governors, and we just came out with an incredible 20 minute short documentary. And if you have sons and friends, and please, it's called Faded Conversations. It's free, it's on YouTube, don't miss it. The stories of these eight men that just happened to answer an ad 
to do an interview for this documentary that the United Way of Broward County is so proud that they produced. Their dialogues and their stories of how they made that decision to seek mental health care, breathtaking, breathtaking, and so absolutely inspiring. And yet, as we speak, and we're gonna talk about mass incarceration in the United States because, because it's all integrated. The drivers, what are the drivers to justice involvement? Getting incarcerated, correct? In the United States. Well, we know it's implicit bias. We know that. Okay, so racial injustice, economic injustice, we get all that. Social determinants of health if you're in the public health sphere, correct? Where you're born, right? Where you work, where you live, where you age, correct? Zip codes, zip code. It's zip code justice, correct? Yes. Or zip code injustice, yes. correct? Thank you. And so how are we as judges, correct? You know, what can we do? Well, if we were sitting in a traditional court, Not much. Why? Because in the traditional court, we don't have that same milieu. We don't have that same paradigm. We don't have that same freedom that we're actually focusing on a certain problem. Yes, we could do certain things in terms of, yes, somebody can go on probation, they can do treatment, they can do this. We've got some things we can do. But there is a very significant difference in what we can do from a problem solving sense using a therapeutic jurisprudence or a TJ uh, type of approach. And that is compassion and humanity becomes elevated. Understood? That is an art form. How do you take a court room or process and literally turn it inside out. That's what we are doing in this court in Broward County that our community is so proud of. Really, an unlikely savior uh, that is credited with this court is a young man by the name of Aaron Wynn who didn't even have mental illness. He was in a really serious motorcycle accident. He had traumatic brain injury. But his parents couldn't get any treatment. Why? Well, you know why. It was less than $39.55 back then in the late 80s, early mid 90s. I, at the time, was not a judge. I was a lawyer doing civil rights work for people with disabilities. There's a lot of synchronicity if, when you read this book in terms of how, you know, innovation happens. So I always like to say innovation from desperation. Well, that is a quarter of that age. Innovation from desperation when a small group of concerned citizens could come together and create change. That is the glorious story of a court of refuge. So here we are. Now we can take a courtroom applying therapeutic jurisprudence with a judge, people don't rise for me, and I don't want them to rise for me, correct? Why? Because my focus, and you can write this one down, is personhood. Personhood. The linkage of justice together with dignity should, equ and equality, should equate <coughs> personhood. What did we know about people with serious mental illnesses? Well, what's your vision of somebody with serious mental illness? Homeless, muttering on a street corner, pushing a shopping cart, spinning in and out of jails, emergency rooms, homeless shelters, that treatment doesn't work, that once sick, you're always gonna be sick. No. 
No, that's, that's untruths. But that's what most people think. How do you dispel that? Well, how about we lay people with care? Treatment works. People get better. They go back to college. They go back to work. They go back to their lives. They have beautiful lives. And yet, when we started this court in June, just over 22 years ago, in 1997, I was only a judge for about five months. I never did a criminal case in my life. No, I'm not making this up. The chief judge, I ran for office with the greatest ice spice gingerbread cookies you could ever imagine. Do you know? Individually wrapped little Debbies, they were seasonal, but they shipped them to us. And, you know, I, again, when, when, well, I do, I do have faith. I think the court was a leap of faith because we had no money at the time, but we did step on a tipping point, and that was that one thing we did have. We had our amazing public defender, Howard Finkelstein. You know, help me, Howard? Yeah. WSBN, he's such a celebrity. He was assigned to represent Aaron Wynn, who, remember, we talked about his motorcycle accident, his traumatic brain injury, well, P.S. No treatment, no help, no services, no benefits, nothing. His parents tried everything. I was a public guardian back then, looking for adults uh, who needed someone to take care of their health, their welfare, their medical decisions, their death arrangements, their housing, get them their benefits. And, you know, these three families came into my office in the span of 10 days. And every family was distraught, hysterical, and just absolutely out of their mind with terror that something was gonna happen to their loved ones with mental illness. And they said exactly the same thing to me. It's just an incredible story. And they said, um, ginger, whatever, ginger, whatever they call them. Um, somebody, told me that you could help my mother. Somebody told me that you could help my brother. Somebody told I mean, well, who, who would say that? We don't even have any services in mental health. I mean, who would say this? And my program didn't even take in people. It was only for adults that mostly advanced in age, but with disabilities who didn't have any family to care for them. So who would be saying this? And then, I just remember walking the last family down, this was in the Midrise building, um, you know, there's just this long corridor to the elevator, and I think at the time I was like, oh my gosh, I was so much younger, and <laughs> my birthday's next week. I don't want to say the number, okay, 60. And it's okay to say it, right? Get it out there so you're not in denial or something, like own it. I didn't even really have to know the position. Turns out, though, 
it was the position that led to the skill sets that I needed to do this work. And that is that I was overseeing, it was a horrible position. I mean, a horrible meaning controversial. And I was overseeing the implementation of a federal class action over our regional state hospital in Pembroke Pines called South Florida State Hospital. You may have heard of it, it's been privatized now. But at the time, they were under a very, very contentious um, federal class action. The, it was filed, that lawsuit, uh, the, the conditions were really, really gross, uh, very grotesque uh, and inhumane when that first, uh, the action was first filed in the late 70s. But to make a long story short, I was responsible. I, I'm probably one of the few judges that practically lived in a state hospital. I did. For a year and a half, that was my office. That is where I worked. Every resident at that state hospital, every patient was my client. And I was uh, also responsible to follow people upon discharge. This was, in effect, a deinstitutionalization action. And we know the failures of deinstitutionalization. But it was my job to follow individuals. Literally, this, the catchment area was the bottom half of the state of Florida. And they were downsizing. And I, it was my job to evaluate discharge plans and uh, feed it back to general counsel in uh, Gainesville. And basically, uh, there was a whole activated system if, it, if the discharges were so horrible and so inappropriate, but the point being is what do we know about the state of Florida? I mean, what are we thinking? How, you know, nobody's a magician. The legislature ended up feeding uh, Broward County, essentially, and the, and the related counties, approximately $25 million infused the system, and we did get some really great innovative mental health models out of that money, but certainly it wasn't gonna take us uh, very far to build the capacity of a system of care, correct? We got our first um, act teams, we got uh, some consumer drop-in centers, we got a mobile crisis team, and we've got some innovations that to this day remain uh, the envy of many other communities. But more than that, as a lawyer, I was trained by a plaintiff's team of some of the most visionary experts in psychiatric rehabilitation, in mental health, in systems of care, in consumer rights, from a civil rights vantage point. These were my teachers. Nobody gets that in law school. So here I am now coming to a judgeship, which I did win unopposed because again, magically, um, the governor at the time was Lawton Childs, that's how long ago this was, and 30 days before qualifying, a seat magically gets funded. I jump into that seat. It's really too late for anybody to mount opposition to those great gingerbread cookies. <laughs> and I got in unopposed, and of course the rest is history because within four months they had a plan for me. And that was, I get a call from the chief judge at the time, Judge Dale Ross, who, if people knew J Judge Ross, because he's retired now, but he's very conservative, and he was not what you would describe as a warm and fuzzy therapeutic judge. And he calls me up on the phone one morning, and he goes like this, well, congratulations, Ginger, you're our new mental health court judge, and remember, there is no such thing. And when would you like to start? And all I kept thinking was, you know, I, I don't know, I had this biblical image that if I didn't, I, like, 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 like the people leaving Egypt, like if I didn't do this immediately, he could change his mind. That's, the, that's how concerned I was, that he's really not the kind of person who would even think that way. It's really, I guess, Howard in our task force. But I said, if you can just give me 10 days. If you can just give me 10 days, it was like, you know, painting a jet in midair. I needed not only what was the court going to do. So what was this court going to do? What did we know? That people were being driven into jail cells. Why? Because they were sick. They're sick. As we're talking right now, there's 386,000 men and women 
that are sick behind bars. That's their crime now. Human Rights Watch came down and watched the court for three days. I've been on every major network you could possibly imagine with this court. We didn't know in Broward County that when we started this court, it had never been done before. What would happen? Okay, somebody enters the jail system. We set up a process where they're intercepted when they appear to be ill, correct? We collaborated with Henderson Behavioral Health Center. We knew who they were working with. I have a rapid docket. I hold court. How long? When are you going to hold court, Ginger? I think I'm going to hold court. I have a regular division. I think I'm going to hold court at least three days a week. I'm gonna do it in the morning, why? Because we want them to get out of jail, we've gotta coordinate the logistics, I'm gonna need the whole day. I'm gonna work with our partners. I'm gonna go around to the entire community who is working on a task force, and I'm gonna beg, plead with them. I know you're not getting another penny, but I really need you to share your resources with this court so I can link people to you. We can, if they're, we're gonna look for the sickest of the sick, I can't waste a minute. People are in jail cells, so what did I do? I embedded the court with a clinician. I put a clinician in the court. I turned the courtroom into a, a psychiatric triage unit. Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. Why? No more out of sight, out of mind. No more out of sight, out of mind. Everything that happens in this courtroom, we want people to know that people who are sick are in jail. Correct? Mental health is essential to overall health. If that's the mantra of the day, take it home, tell everybody. Mental health is essential to overall health. There is no health without mental health. We can't succeed in school. We can't succeed in jobs. We can't succeed in relationships. We're not going to be able to thrive. We're not going to be able to realize our potentials if our mental health isn't good, if we don't have well-being, correct? This is not a game. This is life. This is death. Suicide is the leading cause of death in U.S. jails. Suicide is the leading cause of death in U U.S. jails. It is the third leading cause of death in U.S. prisons. I don't have to tell anybody about excessive use of force in this room. I don't have to tell anybody, if you've been following the Washington Post, and I have over cri with criminal justice reform, and the all, there is no database for people that die by excessive use of force, through law enforcement, correct? There's no database, but the Washington Post has been keeping data. And if you looked at that data, essentially one quarter of all individuals killed through a police encounter, a quarter, 25% has serious mental illness. Untreated mental illness, the consequences are cascading. Erosion of health, absenteeism from work, homelessness, incarceration, drug abuse, suicide. What are we talking about here? Three words, access to care. Access to care. That's really all we're talking about. You need care. You're having a heart attack. I used to go around the country. I was the Department of Justice. I was um, on the national, I went from a campaign circuit to judge to a national circuit along with Sam Cochran from Memphis, Tennessee, who pioneered the first specialized police unit for mental illness, CIT program. For those who may not know, it's crisis intervention teams. So we would go across the United States <coughs> and I would tell audiences, well, okay, so you're walking across the street and you're walking with your your husband or your family member, they grab their chest, right? It looks like they're having a heart attack and they fall to the pavement and what do you expect to happen? What do you expect to happen? But who comes? And who comes? An ambulance. An ambulance, right? You have a major psychiatric episode, who comes? Are we talking health or are we talking crime? 
Are we talking help? Are we talking crime? Are we talking prisoner? Or are we talking patient? See, now, that is the fundamental issue that we've got now. And, you know, if we start to conflate really looking at poverty, really looking at despair, really looking at a loss of optimism, really looking at social determinants of health, you know, look, you can't concentrate in school if you're hungry. You know that. You know that. We know food anxiety, right? Adverse childhood experiences, the ACE study, is applied in my courtroom every day. The impact of adverse childhood experiences, divorce, domestic violence, having somebody in your family that's incarcerated, mental illness, witnessing violence, being abandoned, being neglected, being physically abused, being sexually there's 10 to 12 ACE events. You can go on the website of the CDC, check it out. It's the longest longitudinal study that we have out of, out of Kaiser Permanente that never really applied to criminal justice. Don't we start applying criminal justice? I always applied it in criminal justice. Why? Because it made sense, right? It gives people an explanation. Well, okay, so you have exposure to trauma, and then you do things because you're trying to find a personal solution to emotional and mental health pain and spiritual pain and moral pain, and then all of a sudden you get arrested. Well, we can fix that. In the mental health court, we can fix this. Let's do it together, correct? I'm here. What if you had a judge that goes like this? I'm not making this up. We say this all the time. People practically think. We will do anything in the world. Anything. do anything in the world for you. This court is here for you. I mean, like, dinged. I mean, families, right here, when I got here, a mother just lost her son. Same, same issues as, 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 same issues as, as Aaron Wynn. I had a, I gave her a book, what should I do? I don't know what to do. I, I didn't know what to do. So I'm not really, I mean, I feel very strongly that we all together can make change. That we have to know that early intervention is everything. That mental health is health. That recovery is real. That it shouldn't be treated anything different. That we have to make sure that our policy makers fund mental health and give us the resources and the tools that we need so our communities, our families, our children could be strong and well and thrive, correct? And that we don't wait for crisis, that we don't wait for tragedy, that people don't have to do drugs because they're in so much pain and all they're trying to do is anesthetize and escape, correct? So this is a story about a community that had faith that together with a shared vision we can lead change. There's so many, there's hundreds and hundreds of mental health courts, behavioral health courts in the juvenile, adult level, behavioral health courts. Now it's, a, it's an explosion of justice innovation. That's all well and good. But we are in the greatest opioid and suicide epidemics of our times, and we're not doing enough. Integrated care, Medicaid expansion. Nobody should be not have insurance. Nobody should not be able to afford access to health care, correct? Because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about health equity. This is social justice. This is human rights. The mental health court in Broward County is the first, and I don't know, probably the only one, the only human rights court in the United States that declares itself a human rights state. And we're so proud of it, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. There's something that you didn't touch on, and I wondered if it's relevant. 
Uh, is there such a thing as the genetic memory traces of post-traumatic sleep yes. disorder that may be coming through? Uh, I definitely, I would say this, that you can go in the research of social determinants of health and communities where there is toxic stress because of discrimination that leads to those legacies are very real and it's an evidence base. All right, can we export what you're doing here to Orange County? Uh, <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 